Hey guys, Tyler here. One Star Trek topic that I've been dying to talk about on this channel is the Dominion. Specifically, the Dominion's member races. The largest known political entity in the Gamma Quadrant, the Dominion has persisted for millennia. Its hierarchical structure is primarily composed of three species. At the top is a group of shape-shifting aliens called Changelings, who were the Dominion's founders. Next are the Vorta, who act as administrators. And below them are the Jem'Hadar, the soldiers of the Dominion. For much of its existence, the Dominion has been dedicated to imposing the Founder's vision of order on the universe, which entails bringing all other civilizations to heal under their control. In this three-part video series, I'd like to explore the history of the Dominion and highlight a few of its major species. I'll begin with the Changelings, examining their history and culture as well as their biology. But before we begin, a word from today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes and members all around the world. Whether you're looking to start a new business or enhance your existing skills, Skillshare is the perfect place to start. With classes like photography, illustration, graphic design, and more, Skillshare lets you find classes that match your goals and interests. For example, I just completed Storytelling Through Film, How to Create Engaging Videos for YouTube with Thomas Daher, and I found it rather insightful. Even as my channel grows, I feel there are always new opportunities to learn. This class offered quite a few useful tips that I can implement going forward as I produce more narrative content for my channel. Skillshare is ad-free, so you can stay in the zone while you're exploring new skills. New premium classes are launched each week, so there's always something new to discover. And Skillshare's entire catalog is now available with subtitles in Spanish, French, Portuguese, and German. The first 1,000 people watching this video to use the link in the description will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare. Join today to invest in yourself and your personal growth. Big thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to the founders. Before we get into the Changeling's biology and culture, we first have to establish some background about the Dominion. Its history, its structure, its aims, etc. As we learn in Deep Space Nine, the real origins of the Dominion are rather murky. Various clones of the Vorta Weyun offer differing statements as to the Dominion's true age. In the episode To the Death, Weyun states that the Dominion has endured for 2,000 years, i.e. since the 4th century AD. Later, however, in the episode The Dogs of War, another Weyun says that the Dominion has never surrendered in battle since its founding 10,000 years ago. We know from what you leave behind that the Jem'Hadar became the Dominion's first line of defense about 2,000 years ago, or that is two millennia before the 24th century, giving more credence to the age first established in To the Death. Given Weyun's flair for the dramatic and his tendency to exaggerate, I would say that the 2,000-year figure is probably more accurate. Regardless of the true age of their empire, the Dominion has been around long enough that the true story of its founding, as well as the creation of the Founders' servant races, have all passed into legend. As the story goes, in the ancient past, the Changelings roamed the stars in peaceful exploration. Despite their good intentions, they were, quote, beaten, hunted, and killed by so-called solids, familiar, presumably humanoid carbon-based life forms, who feared the Changelings' shape-shifting abilities. The Changelings subsequently founded the Dominion to protect themselves against persecution by the solids via totalitarian control. They adopted the name Changeling, previously a pejorative, as their own out of defiance and retreated to a rogue planet in the Amarian Nebula. Adopting the philosophy that what you control can't hurt you, the founders realized that they had to guide the solids, believing that they must be broken of their love for freedom. The founders used genetic engineering technology to create at least two servant races. On behalf of the founders, the Vorta and the Jem'Hadar began expanding the Dominion through a mix of diplomacy and conquest. By the mid-24th century, the Dominion has conquered hundreds of species throughout the Gamma Quadrant. The strict hierarchy of the founders at the top, followed by the Vorta, then the Jem'Hadar, and then the subjugated races, is known as the Order of Things, and historically, deviation from the Order of Things has been punishable by death. The founders are rarely encountered by their subjects, which has led to them becoming regarded as gods of a semi-mythical 
commercial status. In fact, the Vorta and Jem'Hadar are both bioengineered to worship the founders and commit their lives to serving them. The founders' extreme longevity has provided them with a unique viewpoint. They do not adjust strategies based on what has happened in the past few weeks or even years, but instead make plans centuries in advance. They prefer not to use military might during initial contacts, but instead take over using influence and espionage. This is showcased in the lead up to the Dominion War, during which changelings infiltrate uh, various Alpha and Beta Quadrant powers and pose as important leaders, instigating conflict between these powers and thus weakening them in prelude for an invasion. Unlike most of the other species in Star Trek's Milky Way, and indeed unlike most other shape-shifting species in the galaxy, the changelings are distinctly liquid-based life forms. In their natural state, most changelings exist as an amalgamated mass of viscous bronze organic matter known as the Great Link. The Great Link is the foundation of changeling society and provides meaning to their existence. While in the Link, changelings have little sense of time or self. They consider linking with one another as the ultimate form of intimacy. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed, changelings regard all other members of their species as their family, though it's unclear if this is a genetic relationship or simply a social one. Being in the Link is considered paradise for the changelings, and even Odo, who bitterly opposes the agenda of the Founders, has long dreamed of returning to it. In fact, this is the changelings' ultimate goal, for all of their people to be united in the Great Link. To this end, despite their protectionist philosophy, the Changelings have engaged in a long-term endeavor to gather as much information as they can about the galaxy. Sometime before the mid to late 22nd century, the Link sent out 100 infant Changelings to wander the stars. These infant Changelings were implanted with an instinctive urge to return to the Omarian Nebula one day. The Founders did not expect any to return until the late 27th century and they did not expect any Alpha or Beta Quadrant powers to reach their space until the mid to late 26th century. Thus, it came as a surprise, naturally, when Starfleet discovered the Bajoran wormhole in 2369 and started exploring the Gamma Quadrant, bringing the founders face to face with one of their own little baby boys, Odo, over 300 years early. While the founders were aware of the Federation long before the wormhole was discovered, their early arrival in the Dominion's backyard forced the founders to reassess their plans. If the Great Link is so great, though, how does it really work? In fact, how do the Changelings reproduce? We don't actually know. Angry comments and coming clickbait. It's highly insinuated that unlike other non-corporeal species like the Organians or the Q, the Changelings were never humanoid. We do know that their cellular structure consists of what is called a morphogenic matrix, and they use morphogenic enzymes in order to facilitate their shape-shifting ability. The morph part of the name implies that the very basis of Changeling biology is fundamentally geared towards shape-shifting, and it's not just some superfluous ability. While many Earth phyla are known to undergo metamorphosis, of course, these transformations happen in distinct stages, and the time elapsed between individual transformations is, well, much longer than instantaneous. Indeed, as I mentioned earlier, the changelings are distinct from even other shape-shifting aliens, such as the cameloids or the elasimorphs. Changelings, or at least inexperienced ones, must revert back to their liquid state every 16 to 18 hours in order to regenerate. Preventing them from doing so can result in physical distress and cause their, their forms, their, their skin, what have you, to deteriorate and flake away. Changelings can take virtually any corporeal form and can even mimic the personalities of humanoids to the point that it's indistinguishable from the original. They can also transform parts of themselves into functional electrical devices, such as computers, pads, and com badges, and even mimic the forms of 
fire and clouds. At least in the DS9 era, it is incredibly difficult for Starfleet sensors to detect a changeling when they mimic other forms, and they cannot be read by telepaths. Shapeshifting even gives changelings a physical empathy with other life forms, allowing them to gain knowledge, a power that the founders used to their advantage during their infiltration of local space. Also, not only do changelings not need to breathe, but they can also survive lengthy periods of time in the vacuum of space, which additionally means that other factors, such as uh, tremendous fluctuations in temperatures, solar winds, or most types of radiation, have negligible negative impact on them. Moreover, as seen in the DS9 episode Chimera, changelings have the potential to become capable of interstellar travel without the need for an actual spacecraft, since they they can obviously learn to somehow generate enough thrust to reach high sublight speeds. A bunch of overpowered blobs, man. <laughs> but that's not even the end of it, folks. Changelings also have no need to take in sustenance even when in humanoid form, even lacking a sense of taste and smell. But somehow they are able to gradually increase their mass and uh, assume more complex forms as they mature. This means that just like any other life form, changelings must derive energy from somewhere. DS9 writer Robert Hewitt Wolf theorized that changelings pull their energy directly from subspace, using a subspace pocket to store additional mass during a morph. Alternatively, they could derive energy through a process called chemosynthesis, or the breaking down of carbon molecules through the oxidation of inorganic compounds or ferrous ions. This process is used by some microorganisms in the dark depths of Earth's oceans able to produce biomass by breaking down lone carbon molecules. However, if this is the way that changelings exchange energy with their environment, it probably would have been observed or at least mentioned in the show. And it's not, but I still wanted to talk about chemosynthesis for a minute. Regarding the radical changes in size during a changeling's transformation, Odo's range has been shown to go from something as small as a sewer rat to something as large as the monster in the episode The Alternate. During the climax, he ends up being around 3 meters or 10 feet tall, and his volume could apparently engulf several full-grown men. Alterations in size of such magnitude can hardly be explained through changes in structural density alone. Furthermore, there's the question of weight as well. Logically, Odo, or any other changeling, should weigh the same at all times, in the same gravity that is. No matter how much they shrink or bloat, and automatically increase or decrease their density accordingly. Well, at least that's what's supposed to happen. In the episode Vortex, Odo transforms himself into a drinking glass and places himself on a tray, which Rom has no trouble carrying. Assuming that Odo weighs the same as an average adult male, around 80 kilograms or 176 pounds, then surely Rom would have noticed that something on the tray weighed 80 kilos, right? Well, the fact that he didn't means that changelings can manipulate their density as well as their weight with no regard for the relevance of their immediate size. As touched upon before, there must be some sort of advanced mass shifting with extra dimensions at play. Normally, if a living being were to change its size, say by pulling its atoms closer together as an Ant-Man, the changes in surface area and volume would cause its metabolism to seize entirely. The way that changelings get around this would involve physics that we hardly understand or have yet to observe, but as for the shared consciousness, well, that's less hard to imagine. Many species exhibit a form of hive intelligence, though changelings separated from the link can obviously function as individuals themselves. So they're not exactly like the Borg, whose hive mind is presumably derived from runaway experimentation with cybernetics. No, the changeling's organic structure allows them to share neural information at will across the entire link. This distributed nervous system is possibly one of the changeling's most alien features and is completely different from traditional brain chemistry. That said, some earth animals, like the octopus, have a nervous system that is distributed across the length of their arms, with 
each one able to act independently. So there is some precedent. New octopuses were aliens. I need to put a Galaxy Quest reference in there. <laughs> When it comes to individual identity, most changelings appear to favor either a male or female form. Though it's uncertain if this is indicative of a true biological sex or gender identity, or simply a matter of preference. Indeed, the real-world reason for this development is probably for the benefit of the audience, since the founders state on multiple occasions how much they despise the solids. They also state that they do not find the humanoid form to be particularly comfortable, and only assume it when interacting with other species to get their message across. Nevertheless, changelings can experience feelings of sexual attraction to humanoids and can even engage in sexual intercourse, though they cannot have a child with a solid. We may never know how exactly changelings reproduce, but as a Vorta would say, the founders work in mysterious ways. So, to recap, in their natural state, changelings exist as a viscous liquid of unknown composition that has a morphogenic matrix and morphogenic enzymes, allowing them to shapeshift. They derive energy from an unknown source, but this source may be tied to subspace, meaning that the changeling's biology may involve extra dimensions beyond the measurements of normal space-time. They may use a pocket dimension to store extra mass during a morph, and they can precisely mimic the properties of just about any organic or inorganic form, allowing them to evade sensor detection. They share thoughts and emotions across a gigantic organic neural network called the Great Link. Though changelings can still express individual identity and sexuality, changelings' preference for order, efficiency, and rules informs their outlook of the universe, which entails supreme authority over a vast and powerful interstellar empire. While we may never have all of the answers when it comes to the Changeling's biology, as well as their true origins, my hope is that this video did serve as at least an overview of what we do know and what could be true. In future videos, I will explore the biology, history, and culture of the other two major Dominion races, the Vorta and the Jem'Hadar. But until then, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. I'm really interested to hear your thoughts in the comments. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description. That's all I have for this week. Live long and prosper, and don't forget to abide by the order of things.